Before we get into today's podcast, I wanted to let you know about a special ebook that's yours to download free today. It's called Five Ways to Connect with God Ancient Practices for Modern Times. It's safe to say that in today's fast paced culture, we're all seeking more rest and less chaos. Only then can we find true connection with our Creator. Five Ways to Connect to God offers five unique spiritual principles to Christians who may be feeling dry when it comes to their prayer life or spiritual fervor. These include practices such as choosing a word for the year, the power of one phrase prayers, and the importance of cultivating thankfulness. Some of these principles are hundreds of years old, yet they offer a fresh way to connect us with the living God. Download your copy of Five Ways to Connect to God by visiting premierinsight.org forward slash resources. That's premierinsight.org slash resources. And now it's time for today's podcast. The Bible in a Year, bringing the Word to life. Father God, in Psalm 119, the psalmist writes, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. May that be true for me today, as I listen to your word. Amen. Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing prayers of my mouth, and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage for ever, they are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Titus chapter 1 Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect, and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who doesn't lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, 
but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Jeremiah chapter 52 Zedekiah was twenty-one years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for eleven years. His mother's name was Hamutal, daughter of Jeremiah. She was from Libna. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as Jehoiakim had done. It was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah, and in the end he thrust them from his presence. Now Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. They encamped outside the city and built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine in the city had become so severe that there was no food for the people to eat. Then the city wall was broken through, and the whole army fled. They left the city at night through the gate between the two walls near the king's garden, though the Babylonians were surrounding the city. They fled towards the Arabah, but the Babylonian army pursued King Zedekiah and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his soldiers were separated from him and scattered, and he was captured. He was taken to the king of Babylon at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, where he pronounced sentence on him. There at Riblah, the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. He also killed all the officials of Judah. Then he put out Zedekiah's eyes, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon, where he put him in prison till the day of his death. On the tenth day of the fifth month, in the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard, who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army, under the commander of the imperial guard, broke down all the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, carried into exile some of the poorest people and those who remained in the city, along with the rest of the craftsmen and those who had deserted to the king of Babylon. But Nebuzaradan left behind the rest of the poorest people of the land to work the vineyards and fields. The Babylonians broke up the bronze pillars, the movable stands and the bronze sea that were at the temple of the Lord, and they carried all the bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, shovels, wick trimmers, sprinkling bowls, dishes, and all the bronze articles used in the temple service. The commander of the imperial guard took away the basins, censers, sprinkling bowls, pots, lampstands, dishes, and bowls used for drink offerings, all that were made of pure gold or silver. The bronze from the two pillars, the sea and the twelve bronze bulls under it, and the movable stands which King Solomon had made for the temple of the Lord, was more than could be weighed. Each pillar was eighteen cubits high and twelve cubits in circumference. Each was four fingers thick and hollow. The bronze capital on the top of one pillar was five cubits high and was decorated with a network and pomegranates of bronze all around. The other pillar, 
with its pomegranates was similar. There were ninety-six pomegranates on the sides. The total number of pomegranates above the surrounding network was a hundred. The commander of the guard took as prisoners Sariah the chief priest, Zephaniah the priest next in rank, and the three doorkeepers. Of those still in the city, he took the officer in charge of the fighting men and seven royal advisers. He also took the secretary who was chief officer in charge of conscripting the people of the land, sixty of whom were found in the city. Nebuzaradan the commander took them all and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. There at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, the king had them executed. So Judah went into captivity, away from her land. This is the number of the people Nebuchadnezzar carried into exile. In the seventh year, three thousand and twenty-three Jews. In Nebuchadnezzar's eighteenth year, eight hundred and thirty-two people from Jerusalem. In his twenty-third year, 745 Jews taken into exile by Nebuzaradan, the commander of the Imperial Guard. There were 4,600 people in all. In the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the year Evel Marduk became king of Babylon, on the 25th day of the 12th month, he released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and freed him from prison. He spoke kindly to him, and gave him a seat of honour higher than those of the other kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put aside his prison clothes, and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table. Day by day the king of Babylon gave Jehoiakim a regular allowance as long as he lived. Till the day of his death. Father God, thank you for the blessing of your word. Help us to treasure it and to put it at the very heart of our lives. Amen. For more resources to help you bring the word to life, go to premier.org.uk forward slash Bible. This reading has been taken from the NIV Bible Biblica and is published by Hodder and Stoughton.